liberation. Buen, buen día o oh, buen <laughs> tarde, ¿verdad? Uh, Ay, yo soy de Nismeda Calderón y soy la moderadora de esta sesión, Preguntas de, lo, de Coloniales sobre la Liberación. The presenters say, los, los presentadores son Rosa Acevedo, Gabriela Veronelli y Otavio Maciel. So we will uh, have all of the presenters go through all of their pre the presentations today and at the very end we'll hold questions. So if you notice in the chat, you can mark an X if you'd like, so that once we get to the question portion of the presentations, uh, we can take questions as they're marked there in the X or you could pose your question there in the chat and I can present it. Um, likewise, you can message me directly and I can present that question. Um, Todos los presentadores van a presentar, presentar sus trabajos y al fin de la sesión vamos a tener tiempo para hacerles preguntas. Um, pueden marcar una X en el chat si quiere este, hacer su pregunta o me puede mandar la pregunta y yo puedo um, darle las preguntas así. Bueno, uh, Gabriela puede empezar con las presentaciones. Gracias, Denise. Uh, gracias a todos por estar acá. Caras nuevas, caras viejas, compañeros de CIPIC que los veo ahí apoyando como siempre. Uh, so, um, I am going to read a different paper than the one I proposed regarding linguistic strategies on decolonization. And uh, while Two months ago, when I was in the middle of doing the research for that paper, uh, my dear friend and political compañera Maria Luones Paz, so uh, that just froze me and, 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 and I couldn't continue. And, and I didn't want to give you, you know, just a very drafty version of that work that I promise it's gonna come at some point. Uh, nonetheless, what I'm presenting today works as a background for discussing linguistic decolonial options as it situates the question of language in a broader decolonial project. I explore some of the ways we need to rethink language in order to further decolonization. And I argue that the role of language in furthering decolonization and liberation is compromised by understanding of understandings of language inherited from the colonial project an inheritance that I refer to as the coloniality of language, how the communicative conditions created by coloniality restrict building connections of dialogue, even in what is ostensibly liable the same language. Since the 60s, decolonization theory has been renovated and strengthened by a number of schools, among them philosophy and theology of liberation, dependency theory, postcolonial theory and orientalism, subaltern studies, critical race theory, black radical theory, black Atlantic studies, women of color feminism and third world feminism, and decolonial thought. These schools share the view that we still live in a colonial world and we need to break away from the narrow ways of thinking about colonial relations in order to fulfill the incomplete and unfinished project of decolonization. A common thread through all these schools is an awareness of the effects of colonization, not only as political, historical, and economic forces, but also as effects on consciousness, theories, research practices, epistemological frameworks, and ways of knowing. One of the central questions that the colonial philosophy addresses is that philosophy has not seen the colonized indigenous people. This does not mean that from a decolonial perspective, philosophy has not produced valuable work. It means that this work has not spoken to the colonized or to the question of racialization of the colonized. It means that the colonized has not impact in philosophical production. This problem is not, of course, uh, 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 has been uh, uh, shared by Latin American canonical philosophy from Thomism to analytical philosophy. And of course, at some point, there's a break with the debate that started in the 60s between Ramo, Ramos, Sea, Salazar, Bondi as main figures that paved the way for the very important developments in the discipline and for philosophy of liberation. In my view, decolonizing philosophy is a project that makes it possible 
for those who have not been seen by philosophy to become philosophical agents. My project is part of decolonizing philosophy in terms of how to listen to the colonized and how to engage in dialogues. The concept that I'm presenting today, monolanguaging, defines the way in which for those who live in realities structured in hegemonic, monolingual cum monological ways, a series of deafnesses, deafness, sorderas, are produced that make impossible a listening and entering into the life world of colonized beings and leads them to internalize the belief that they are linguistically and culturally inferior. In my presentation, I will explain how the coloniality of language operates by positioning colonized populace, populations and linguistically, communicatively, and mentally subhuman. So this is the first part. In order to develop a decolonial perspective in philosophy, we need to open philosophy to concerns that made on the face of it not seem, not seem to be outside philosophy's purview. Philosophies of race and gender has discovered something similar. I draw on such thinkers as Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano in order to see the colonize. The importance of Quijano is that he offers an understanding of race that is tied to the experience of exercising power over others in order to use them. Quijano gives us the useful concept of coloniality of power. By this framework, he means a model of power that articulates the structural interconnections among capitalism, colonization, and the creation of a racial division of the human that produces a source of cheap labor. In Quijano's conception, race is not an a priori, but developed in looking at people to exploit them, fashioned at the point of encounter of a proto-capitalist society reaching possible increase in the labor force and what is possible about this labor force. In Quijano's conception, race is derived from the position of the colonizer in respect to the colonized. There is no approaching the colonized without power and how is that power needs to see the colonized. The articulation between race and labor transformed the conception of human in such a way that the perceiver, the colonizer, sees the colonized and does not see and cannot see a human person, but bodies of labor. Quijano's framework reveals the colonized and the dehumanization of the colonized, both in terms of labor that take away humanity and in modern terms, in those terms, in those constructions of authority, knowledge and intersubjectivity that are aimed at both denigrating the indigenous cognitive, linguistic, cosmological, economic, reproductive, affective practices as not human and at replacing them or judging them from the Eurocentered practices as those characteristically human. The inextricably relation between the coloniality of power and modernity naturalizes the experience of those within this model of power. This changes the meaning of modernity to modernity coloniality, so that now they are fused. This move from modernity to modernity coloniality is a decolonial turn that led us to see the underside of modernity, so we see the colonized and the fiction of the conception of the colonized. And at the same time, Quijano brings us an idea of race that both see the fiction of race and the colonized awareness of that fiction, as he himself, Quijano, is of the colonized. He confronts the thinking that has constructed him. Second part. Language is an important part of the social world, and I want to understand the role language has in the exercise of colonial power. My research looks at how the distinction between human and non-human and the concept of race a la Quijano is at work in language. So drawing on Quijano's coloniality of power, I developed the notion of the coloniality of language. The coloniality of language is a derivative and a complementary of the coloniality of power. It examines the role of linguistic colonialism and racism in the expansion of global capitalism, beginning with the constitution of Latin America, naming and naming the structural process by which race and language categories and racial and linguistic hierarchies were tied together. I argue that there's a link between the introduction in the 16th century of the global Eurocentered capitalist system of power that organized labor, social relations, knowledge and political authority in terms of race and 
and a racist linguistic ideology that has obscured the oppression. The idea of the the idea of dehumanization occurs in pernicious ways here when we are thinking of language, taking the shape in the expectations of what characterizes a normative speaker in control of organizing and signifying a normative construction and organization of the colonial society. The colonized, from this perspective, cannot inhabit the position of a normative speaker. The theoretical understanding allows us by the coloniality theory of power and the idea of race that Quijano gave us, that is not an a priori, but something, an idea that arises together with seeing bodies that are than seeing persons in the encounters of Europeans with indigenous people, suggests, this, this theoretical understanding suggests, even entails a difficulty in understanding the colonized people as communicative agents beyond the most rudimentary and communicative possibilities. To find in the colonized people the ability to express complex political, philosophical, economical meaning is at odds with re their reduction to natural inferior beings. So as I move from coloniality of power to coloniality of language, begin, I begin with the hypothesis that centers the communicative relation between colonizer and colonized at the moment of the encounter. This hypothesis proposes that if the idea of race constructs the perception of the colonizer, then when, the meeting, when meeting the colonized, the colonizer sees not a person but bodies, not human animals, non-human animals who can labor and thus without any complex form of communication without language. This is the fiction that acquires a degree of reality as it's tied to power. Uh, so given the idea of humanity tied to rationality, it can be affirmed that in the colonial encounter, the colonized perceive indigenous people in speaking their tongues as doing less than being able to express knowledge. The question is how much less? This question took me to investigate the linguistic paradigm being developed at the time of the conquest within the political confines of the Spanish crown. In the work of Elio Antonio Nebrija, the author of the first grammar of Spanish in 19, 1492, and Bernardo de Aldrete, another humanist who works 100 years later than uh, uh, Nebrija and whose work is mostly centered in literacy. The hypothesis of the coloniality of language is about the ontological and epistemic consequences of the transformation introduced by the coloniality of power at the level of language. How coloniality conditions what a language is. How the classification of people into races that are superior and inferior is accompanied by thinking of their expressive tools they have in also in these terms of superiority and inferiority. So when, we, when I look at Nebrijas and Aldetre's work uh, and their arguments, what, uh, uh, what they give me is an account of these conditions of what counts as a human language. They give a sense of what it means in the 16th century that a language is or is not human in some fundamental sense. They do not perform a classification of language in an Aristotelian sense, but rather they tell us about the philosophical linguistic criteria produced for that inferiority and superiority. What these criteria prescribe at this point, at, at the 16th, 17th century, of the, at this point of the encounter, is a relationship between language and territory, language and power, language and writing, and language and God. So that when looking at the languages of being that are by nature inferior, that are subhuman, from this criteria, these are not and cannot be languages. The rationale of the criteria performs racialization. The languages of the colonizers were languages in the full sense. The languages of the colonized were something inferior, incapable of expressing the complex views represented by European languages. In my work, I use the term simple communication and simple communicator to capture the colonizer's imagination of the colonized as having no language, that is, no Eurocentrically valorized expressivity. 
simple communicators are incapable to engage in rational communication, in dialogue, because they lack the capacity of understanding and expressing ideas that the European thought rational. The coloniality of language shows then that from the onset of Western European colonization, colonized people were stripped of their humanity, at least in part, through a perception and representation of their languages in less than human, animalistic terms that suggests that they were incapable of expressing ideas that the European thought were an integral to being a full human being. In this way, the coloniality of language positioned colonized populations as linguistically subhuman. So now let me move to the second part of, of the paper. I will do this uh, uh, quickly. Uh, but just, you know, to go into conversations of liberation. So as a decolonial philosopher, I consider that the necessity and the possibility of a paradigmatic shift in the way of thinking and perceiving reality. In my case, the way of thinking language and linguistic practices. In this section, I turn to the work of Chilean biologist Humberto Maturana, whose concept of languaging I have find very helpful. When I, what I found useful in the concept of languaging is that it enables me to move from the noun to verb, from language already thought as a finished product to languaging as an ongoing and situated activity. The noun language as a code and competence refers to something already given that precedes communicative interactions and presupposes unified and homogeneous community of speakers. What makes the paradigm shift is that instead of seeing something produced with features that are decided upon those with power and who tied power, humanity, knowledge, and language, through the move to verb, through languaging, we see the enactment of expressivity and communication itself. And as praxis, language is always done by someone in a particular time and place. That is, it always understood to be attached to the materiality of everyday life which provide us with a way of understanding the practices and experiences of the interlocutors. To speak of the language, of the action to language, is always to speak of an interaction, and not just any interaction, but the interaction that serves as basis for all social interactions among human beings. Languaging, as Maturana presents it, is the way in which human beings live together as they live together. Languaging as a way of social life includes words and signs to communicate. I want to emphasize the use of words and signs by speaker with the intention of communicating with a listener who is expected to understand the speech act. In Maturana's term, this expectation of understanding means that the speaking and the listening share a way of life, of living together, which is expressed or better move with signs and words. But it's important to note that in Maturana's view, we share a way of life, not because we have a common culture of history or language, but because we have a mutual disposition in favor of communicating with each other. For further details of this, Maturana explains the etymology of the term converse, from the Latin conversari, to keep company, to turn, to go around with others. In this movement of going around in company, of moving together, that language in points to, words direct the receive attention and consequently the other's experience of what is happening towards a concrete what, where, how, and why, which is a way that presupposes and continues to foster the construction of consensual reality. That means, Words do not represent, but they orient because they suggest possibilities, possibilities that may be picked up, may be negotiated, or may never be consented at all, but nevertheless, all in all, help to create a fundamental sense of moving together, of deeper between us. What matters most is that what is suggested is not a matter of content, of meaning, but primarily of sociality a way of living together, being a book. And now to, to finish, uh, 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 I'm following the concept of languaging that uh, uh, I interpret from Maturana. I have developed the concept of monolanguaging. 
By monolanguaging, I mean the material and discursive praxis of linguistic racialization. With this concept, I want to question the communicative interaction in colonial situations in terms of the human-non-human -human dichotomy. As I will show, monolanguaging refers to the communicative interactions between, on the one hand, beings who perceive the self as fully human and rational and who speak full languages, and on the other hand, linguistically racialized beings who are assumed to lack reason. Through, through monolanguaging, the former dehumanizes the latter. To understand the concept of monolanguaging and what is mono about it, I propose we hypothetically consider the following situation. We have the colonizer conceived as superior as fully human being. The colonizer holds to the presupposition that he's fully human and possesses knowledge that holds universally, that has universal value and carries with it the only possibility of truth. So when the colonizer addresses the colonized in some manner or another, does he hold the presupposition that the colonized is somebody who also has knowledge? The answer is no. As I have said, in the colonial racial imaginary of the 16th century, and given the idea of race, to the colonizer, the colonized is inferior by nature and has no reason in the Eurocentric sense of reason, which for the former, for the colonizer, is the mark of the human. Now, given that the colonizer ways of life and expectation that any communication will be understood, does he, the colonizer, address the colonized with that expectation, or does he perceive the colonized as a being who cannot fulfill the expectation of understanding? This is not a matter of languages and system of meaning. The expectation that the other would understand the speech act presupposes that the other is rational. If the other is a racialized other and thus not rational, the colonizer could not have that expectation. The way dehumanization works at the level of language and speech act is by presupposing that the other could not fulfill the expectation of understanding what the colonizer communicates. I'm about to finish. While in languaging, people pay attention to each other, thus opening a space for moving and doing things together, this space can be one of conflict, ambiguity, impatience. As we orient the, as we orient the interlocutor in Maturana's languaging towards the direction we want to go in the conversation, we are never really able to avoid uncertainty. But all in all, there is a sense of togetherness. And although communication might indeed be extremely hostile, it does create a sense of recognition that the other is the interlocutor, is an interlocutor. This is to me Maturana's significant contribution to understanding communication and the difficulty of communication and how relations of power, domination, and colonization affect communication, and a path to think decolonization from this perspective. The problem is not primarily of content on meaning, but of recognition, inclusion or exclusion from the between us, a desire to affirm or negate the other as an interlocutor. Then, going back to my concept of monolanguaging, in the colonial encounter, the presupposition is that the colonized by nature cannot be an interlocutor. That is what mono is, that is what is mono in monolanguaging. The sociality of languaging is being frozen, as it were, because the colonized is assumed to be by nature incapable of satisfying the expectation of understanding what the other says. So, uh, uh, so to conclude, uh, the colonial philosophy offers the possibility of new creative and innovative approaches to contemporary problems. One question that we continue to wrestle is how to engage in dialogue with indigenous philosophies. I haven't answered this question here, but rather give you a concept to understand the kind of work that is necessary to be done in order to listen to the colonized. I present to you the concept of monolanguage to define situations and communicative practices that are racist, not because their content, but because of the grounding communicative expectations and presuppositions that sustain those communication expectations. I hope you find it useful as a tool to analyze the communicative aspects of historical relations between colonizers and colonized group, as well as critically think racism today in our society. Thank you. 
Gracias, Gabriela, for your uh, presentation on rethinking language in order to further liberation. I see that uh, Alejandro Vallega has a question. If, if it's possible, can we hold that till the end, um, Dr. Vallega? Yes, great, thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Rosa Acevedo presenting Decolonial Critiques to the Sea of Whiteness. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to thank Don Dere and all the organization committee that made possible this conference. Um, I'm very excited after hearing Gabriela Veronelli presentation. Um, as you will see, there's a lot of overlap with my presentation, especially because for me, the question of race is central for understanding the operation of coloniality. Um, so I'm very happy for all that background that you presented. Um, es necesario hablar sobre la blanquitud y cómo esta ha sido constitutiva y aún lo continúa siendo como un horizonte que niega el ser y el valor de los sujetos racializados y colonizados. Es importante que el diálogo sobre los problemas de la colonialidad en el sur global y las apuestas a proyectos de coloniales incluyan una reflexión sobre el rol de la blancura en los espacios culturales, académicos, estatales y económicos. To begin a dialogue about whiteness in the colonial context, I want to expand the understanding of the coloniality of power with the question of how whiteness contributed to the consolidation of European power in the Caribbean and Americas. I will expand the centrality of race in global capitalism to incorporate the role of whiteness in the emergence of the coloniality of power. The first section of my presentation aims at providing a brief introduction to the concept of coloniality of power in its relationship with race, capitalism, and modernity in the works of Aníbal Quijano. In the second section, I will complicate the relationship between race and coloniality with Sylvia Winter's analysis of the historical process by which the figure of the modern human emerged in conjunction to the racialization and negation of the human other, the non-European. In the third and last section, I will end with Franz Fanon's diagnosis of racial alienation and his reflection of the white imaginary and the ontological negation that comes with the white gaze. My aim is to point at the inextricable link between whiteness, racism, modernity, capitalism, and coloniality in establishing a system that still continues to thrive today with white supremacy and the negation of blackness in colonial spaces. The first section. In Colonialidad del Poder y Clasificación Social and Colonialidad del Poder, Eurocentrismo y América Latina, Peruvian sociologist Aníbal Quijano described the complex pattern of power established in America after 1492. The end of the 15th century initiates the development of a form of modernity that will be prior to what Europeans coined as their modernity, which is the coloniality modernity. Modernity and coloniality are mutually co-constituted in two directions. First, colonization and global capitalism created the conditions of possibility for the development of a Eurocentric worldview that achieved its highest point with the Enlightenment. Second, the rational project of modernity inadvertently became the epistemological justification for exploitation and dominance over non-European people and land. With the term coloniality of power, Quijano traces the convergence of two historical processes during colonization. The articulation of different forms of labor resources and products with global capitalism and the creation of the idea of race. Quijano acknowledged uh, that the origins of capital as a form of social relation based on the commodification of labor can be traced back to the 11th and 12th century, but the expansion of the capital in the global market took shape with colonization. The coloniality of power allowed the articulation of different forms of labor, including non-wage labor as slavery, serfdom, reciprocity, and small mercantile production as part of the global circulation of capital. Coloniality thus can also be understood as one of the elements of the global pattern of labor and capital. The second key ace of the coloniality of power was the invention of the idea of race. Kihan observes that prior to European um, 16th century colonization, there were other systems of social classification and stratification that regulated areas of sex, gender, authority, nature, and subjectivities. 
we trace Kihano identifies the creation of a new social identity that reduced and homogenized group of people, culture, civilization under one racial category. The first racial category, the Indian, obliterated the differences among tr different tribes and civilizations that were already developed in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mayas, Incas, Chimus, Aymaras, Aztecs, Tainos, and many others. Similar violent operation occurred with the reduction of tribes and group of what later became termed as Africa. Sulus, Ashantis, Congos, Yoruba, Bakongos, and many more. With the, with the development of colonization, new racial categories like Mestizo, Amarillo, Mulato were created in different places that varied by language and colonial authority. The idea of race became an instrument to naturalize both the colonial and capitalist domination. Europe and whiteness were constructed as the reversal of the social construction of America in the racial categories of black indigenous and other racialized um, categories. In what ways does the modern conceptualization of the human relies on the model of whiteness? In order to begin addressing this question, I will move to a short account of the relationship between the emergence and process of racialization and the creation of the modern man with the work of Jamaican philosopher, Sylvia Winter. In the essay, Unsettling the, Col the Coloniality of Being Powered Through Freedom Toward the Human After Man is Overrepresentation and Argument, Winter that provides an archaeology of the epochal changes in the category of the human from Asian medieval Christian Europe to the modern construction of a category of the human that relied on the differentiation with the, sorry, um, from the medieval Christian Europe to the modern construction of the category of human that relied on the differentiation with the human other, the racialized and colonized population. On this complex historical reconstruction, Winter traces uh, the shift from one episteme, uh, the Christian medieval, to the antecedents of the modern episteme, with a dispute about the legitimation, legitimation of the Spanish crown, about uh, the indigenous and bodies and land. Winter reveals this shift with the debate in the 16th century between Bartolomé de las Casas and Ginette de Sepúlveda about the treatment and nature of indigenous people under the Spanish crown. Winter situates this debate as a clash of two discrete segments of the human. A theocentric conception of the human, what Winter names man one, and a new humanistic and racial centric conception of the human, what Winter names uh, man two, which is the secular political subject of the state. What is striking is that the gradual shift towards a modern secular conception of the human coincides with the necessity for conceptualizing the new human other, the colonized subject. With the creation of race, Winter identifies a new form of legitimation for the colonization of non-European lands and the authority over non-European subjects. Initially, the Catholic Church provided the theological juridical legitimation of the sovereignty of Spain and Portugal over the recently conquered non-European land and people through the concession of Papa Bulls and the doctrine of terra nullis, the land of no one. However, with time, Spain attempted to articulate new claims of legitimacy for the colonial expansion beyond the control of the Catholic Church. The new form of human differentiation was made with the racialization of the natives and African slaves. As part of the racialization of the new population, the Spanish returned to the readings of Aristotle to bring back a new form of by nature differentiation between the Spanish and the irrational savages, Indians, or the subrational Negroes. Winter observes how the by nature differentiation constructed a human other based on phenotypical and religious differences in terms of degrees of rational perfection, imperfection scale. The Negro, was placed at the bottom of human classification, representing in some discourses the missing link between rational humans and irrational animals. It is not an accident that the black population was placed at the bottom of human classification, since even before the Portuguese slave trade in the 15th century, already Europe had negative rep representation of blackness and dark people. 
One of the antecedents of the negative association with blackness was the Christian representation of black as a diabolical color used to represent demons and sin, and the association of dark people with the curse of son of Ham in the Genesis story. Another important antecedent Winter presents is the idea of racial purity during Spanish Inquisition and expulsion against Muslim Jews and conversos. I quote um, Winter. A specific reprobation was therefore now placed on these two categories, that of their impurity and or uncleanness of blood and also of their faith because descended from ancestors who had practiced the Jewish and Islamic creeds." End of quote. The logic of purity of blood was then rearticulated again in the construction of Europe and later whiteness as pure in contrast to the impurity of the black other. Race was constructed not only as an articulation of the coloniality of power, but also as the over-representation of the human, in this case, the modern secular political subject of the state. What is lurking behind the convergence of racism and capitalism is the imposition of a model of humanity, which privileged the European civilization and later whiteness as a racial feature of this geocultural construction. What neither Quijano nor Winter explain is how whiteness operates in the construction of non-white categories and how the relativization of colonized population contributed to establishing whiteness as the model of humanity. I will move to Caribbean thinker Franz Fanon to understand the social and psychological role that whiteness played in the constitution of racial categories in the colonial situation. In Black Skin, White Mass, Fanon departs from his own experience in Martinique to describe the social, psychological, phenomenological condition of alienation of Antillean subjects, particularly the Black men. Understanding the racial alienation of the Black subject is necessary to analyze the interplay of social structures and institutions imposed by the colonized power and its relationship and effect on the psychological structures of the colonized subject. This analysis of the racial conflict in the colonial space required then a sociogenic approach. Lewis Gordon says, the sociogenic pertains to what emerged from the social world, the intersubjective world of culture, history, language, and economics, end of quote. Sociogenic analysis follow a, uh, allows for a complex understanding of the social structures and psychological dimension that account for the contradiction of how blackness is lived in Antillean subject and how this racial alienation is intertwined with the consolidation of whiteness. The economic and political imposition of the colonizer is reinforced with the imposition of the white imaginary predicated on white superiority. In the chapter, The Negro and Psychopathology, Fanon reflects on the cultural imposition of stories and characters directed to white children coming from the white world, uh, whether from Europe or the United States, that became dominant cultural uh, source for the Antillean children. The problem with American European children's stories is the systematic association of good and heroic characters with white figures and the association of bad criminal and savages character with black and indigenous representation. For Fanon, this creates a trauma in which Antillean children identify themselves with the white characters. At this stage, the Antillean subject does not recognize himself, themselves as black, but rather distance themselves from the black subject that lives in Africa. And Fanon says, little by little, one can observe in the young Antillean the formation and crystallization of an attitude and way of thinking and seeing that is essentially white. End of quote. Blackness and subjectivity of the colonized subject is constituted by the imago that the European half of the colonized black subject. Racial alienation is intensified when the Antillean subject internalized and reproduced the European and white imago of himself. This leads to, to an unbearable contradiction and psyche rupture when the Antillean encountered whiteness in the colonial metropole. One important insight that Fanon advanced is how racial alienation is not only a product of cultural imposition, but also the result of an ontological negation. The colonial situation imposes an ontology. 
a description and valuation of reality and being that negates the value of black existence by imposing a metaphysics and values of Western theodicy predicated on the appraisal of European civilization and white humanity. As explained by Gordon, Western civilization supposes a form of absolute being that determines the weight of being human. In the colonial situation, the imposition of Western ontology is lived as a contradiction since it demands the colonized subject to hold the tenets of Western civilization that deny their own beings and humanity. The ontological negation of being and any form of value in blackness places the colonized subject to live in the zone of non-being. Following Winter and Fanon, whiteness seen in the colonized, sub colonized context over determines the ontological valorization of what become the model for humanity negating the value of black and colonized subjects. I move now to my conclusion. In this presentation, I have attempted to demonstrate the colonial logics of whiteness in two ways. First, how it emerged as part of the coloniality of power. And second, how whiteness and blackness are co-constituted as racial identity and form of being in colonized space. First, Kiano provides a framework to understand the function of whiteness in the colonial history, both as part of the process of social classification through the creation of the idea of race, and as part of the process of social domination, economic exploitation of global modern capitalism. Sylvia Winter analyzed in more detail the continuities and discontinuities in the process of the representation of the human with the creation of the modern secular political subject, which cannot be separated from the process of racialization of the colonized population. Similar to Quijano, Winter analyzes the dialectics of the construction of the European subject and the construction of the human order. What Winter emphasized is the intertwining of the construction of the category of the human and the process of race classification. Europe, the dominant colonial class and the Western bourgeoisie overrepresented their conceptualization of the human, which was constructed with the exclusion and subordination of the racialized population. I draw on Winter's overrepresentation of the human to claim that it is an overrepresentation that, what can, that can be seen in Fanon with the self-proclaimed superiority of whiteness. Winter begins to allude to this when she claimed that today, the space of otherness is created through the color line that divides the world population between white and not white people. Fanon presents a more detailed account of how whiteness operates in his contemporary Martinique, both at the level of social structural domination, but also at the level of the coloniality of being. His sociogenic account allowed us to see how whiteness functions as a pattern of colonial domination in the imposition of a white imaginary um, on top of the economic and political domination. Fanon is clear of the representation of economic and political domination when he states that in the inferiority complex experienced by Black Antillian is foremost a result of economic process. But the inferiority process is also an effect of a situation of racial alienation and abjection of Blackness in relation to the superiority and desirability of whiteness. With Fanon, one can see a more detailed um, racial concretization of the form of overrepresentation of whiteness and its projection as the standard of humanity. The projection of whiteness as a form to achieve human recognition renders black colonized subjects in a zone where their being and humanity are negated. The zone of non-being can therefore be understood as a manifestation of what Nelson Maldonado Torres has termed the coloniality of being. As we have seen with Winter's description of Blacks as subhuman and the negation of Blackness in Fanon, the coloniality of being transforms human alterity, as Maldonado Torres points, into the negation of being of the other. Um, Maldonado Torres says, invisibility and dehumanization are the primary expression of the coloniality of being, end of quote. The lack of ontological significance that black subject occupies in the zone of non-being is what normalized the enslavement of African and continues to justify the superiority of whiteness and the value of white lives over non-white and black lives. Inspired by Fanon, 
I close this presentation with the question of how to undo the hegemony of whiteness in the social imaginary and the devaluation of blackness in the colonized and post-colonized spaces. The colonial critique is just a first step towards a project that affirms life, projects and resistances of communities and people that, like Fanon, have resisted the dehumanization of the colonized and white gaze. Thank you. Gracias, Rosa, por su trabajo, uh, Decolonial Critiques to the Sea of Whiteness. Y ahora vamos a este, escuchar el trabajo de Otavio Maciel, Complex Realism and a Gender Theory of Decoloniality. Otavio Maciel. Thank you, everyone. Uh, as I was trying to write a, a paper to present to you, I was faced with many challenges because everything that I was trying to say was very weird uh, in relation to what we are used to listening. Uh, and then I tried to explain it and the paper was getting extremely big. So I decided to thank the paper and just uh, talk to you about the topics and the ideas that I'm trying to present. They are a little unorthodox because uh, I come from uh, a, a metaphysical uh, studies in philosophy and I study numbers and I study nature and I study uh, uh, the, the process of nature and organism and Whitehead and Hartmann and many philosophers that are not very well known. So when I came to decolonial studies, people ask me why? What are you doing here? And that's a genuine question that I'm, I'm going to try to answer to you. So I'm here uh, today not as a, a lecturer, so to speak, but as a diplomat trying to uh, create alliances and see how, uh, how we can proceed in a, in a more complex way. What I call complex realism is a, a form of metaphysics that has been flourishing uh, for quite some time, but it has been uh, on the spotlight at least since 2000, 2007, uh, when people from new realisms and uh, speculative realisms and all sorts of new metaphysical turns on the you know, on global philosophy, and these people have been trying to say we need to look back to reality. That we have uh, we have ecological problems. We have global problems. We have uh, so many problems that cannot be solved by nationalism. That cannot be solved only through language, but we need language. Not only through history, but we need history. So everything gets so complicated, so entangled, and so uh, um, uh, intertwined that things get a little hard even to explain. So what I, I'm going to say to you today, is I, I ask you at, please to keep an open mind. Uh, and that's one, uh, one of the expressions that I would like to talk to you. Uh, it comes from Bruno Latour, a uh, French philosopher. Uh, and he says, everybody wants to be ecological Everybody wants to be uh, look after the planet, to take care of the environment, but nobody seems to be a, to to be willing to pay the price for the openness of mind, for the ouverture d'esprit. Uh, and when he, he he writes this on his book, Enquête uh, sur les modes d'existence, uh, the investigation of the modes of existence. And he tries to conceive of a, a, an anthropology, a philosophical anthropology, to, to have at least 16 modes of existence so we can analyze modernity and what the hell they did, uh, if their values are, are interesting, if the, the program has something to, to be saved. And his, his idea is, and he's talking with a Brazilian anthropologist at this point, uh, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, uh, and he say Eduardo is protecting his Amazon people that he is uh, communicating, and that's a uh, 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 thing that I would like to say to Gabriela uh, that we have uh, in Brazil uh, uh, many attempts to try to approach the indigenous people 
And one of them is uh, uh, our famous anthropologist, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, who has worked with the lower Amazon basin, Indians, indigenous peoples. And he is uh, writing about perspectivism and animism in a very innovative and very interesting way. So uh, that, that is someone who is trying to pay the price for ontological and philosophical openness of mind. He is not just sitting uh, and say, oh, we need to go back to Marx, to Nietzsche, to Freud, to, okay, these guys are important, but perhaps we should be going not exactly to Vienna, but perhaps to the lower Amazon basin, perhaps. That's uh, Eduardo's uh, 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 bet. Well, and, and then Latour says, I am trying to do the same with the moderns. The moderns are my indigenous people. He says, I'm doing an anthropology of the moderns. I am doing like a field study. I'm doing ethnography. I'm doing uh, like with that, that British hat and they, they go there and take notes. So that's what he's doing with his own people. And, and he's trying to say, not everything that these people are doing is bad, but we need to understand how bad it is in order to criticize it. And in order to see what are we doing when we say we have never been modern, for example. Uh, he's not trying to say that colonization didn't exist. He's not trying to say that capitalism doesn't exist. He's trying to say things that are a little more, even a little more radical. He's trying to say things, for example, the social as a whole, it doesn't exist. We get a little shocked because we learn all our lives that the social is there, the social is that, and it has a whole uh, uh, defense for this for this point. But the, the idea is not that we do not exist in groups, in networks, in, in associations. He tries to change our point of view from the social as a whole, a uh, big whole, the, the, the double entendre is intentional and he tries to shift our intention our attention uh, towards network building and these networks they are for him more real than we talking about the big hole or whatever that means what does that mean uh, it means that there are many uh, conceptual networks that were brought by Europeans and moderns, especially uh, the modern people in Europe, but also it stems from a religious idea of Christendom. The Christendom is the unity of Christianity, and that usually meant uh, that everybody that is not Christian is automatically bad. So what did they have in mind during that time? At three peoples. They had in mind the Jewish people. They are, they crucify Jesus. They are bad people. They should all be killed. They should all be expelled. That is the anti-Semitism that is very uh, uh, present in the origins of modernity. Uh, Islamophobia. Uh, all of us here, we are descend. I believe we are all descendants or we are at least close to Iberian peoples from Spanish and the Portuguese. And they have a, uh, their national foundation is founded upon uh, Islamophobia. It's founded upon uh, expelling the Moors, expelling the Arabic people, expelling Islam from the Iberian Peninsula. So it was a mission of Christian Christendom to expel the infidels. And today we criticize Muslims for doing the same. So that sounds a little uh, uh, hypocritical at, at least uh, because Portugal and Spain, they were founded upon this Islamophobic idea and this anti-Semitic idea. But now we have also a third group that is uh, not very common in Iberia, but it was the pagan the heathens, the, those do, that were not from any Abrahamic faith. What does that mean? Uh, most people don't know, but there were pagan people in Europe up until the 18th century. In, in Estonia, in Finland, in the northern 
uh, Norway and Sweden uh, and even in Iceland. So uh, there was also this mission to show to these people the true faith. So Islam is bad, Jew Judaism is bad, pagans are uh, uneducated. They are they, they, they didn't chose the wrong religion. They were just born that way. So they need to be taken pity on. So we need to go there and with the Bible and, and bring them to the fold and, and whatever. So this mindset has been present on, on, your, on Christendom for hundreds of years before coloniality. So when, when you take uh, uh, their, their, what they thought they were doing, they didn't say, we are building the white world, we are building the one true language, we're building the, 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 the... No, they said, we're saving these people in their minds. They were saying, we are saving these people. Why? Because American Indians, they are uneducated, just like the pagans in Europe. They have a soul, they are pure, they are untainted by filth, so they can be saved, so they can be uh, repurposed, they can be uh, put into another uh, framework that will help them to become uh, 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 truly evangelized. They will see the good word and they will shine, whatever that means. So in their minds, they were doing what they have always been doing. So it's not a complete novelty when they say we need to, to, to turn these peoples into Christ. They, they need to abandon their religion, which is not actually a religion. It's a bunch of superstitions and, and rain dances and bonfires. And they need to, to go to the church and they need to, to accept God. Which God? The Christian God. Not the Muslim, not the, the Jewish God. Um, and, and when you look what they did to the, to the African peoples, uh, when you read uh, Padre Antonio Vieira, he is one of the first uh, mich Portuguese missionaries here in Brazil. And he wrote that the black people, they lived in Satanism. So they were worshipers of Satan. They did voodoo. They did, uh, uh, as they call here in Brazil, macumba. They did these weird black arts and they were akin to the devil. What are we, Portuguese, what are we doing? We are doing them a favor by giving them a chance to pay for their sins. That was their mindset. He wrote this. This is a priest from the from the 16th century. He said, these people, they worship Satan and they need to be punished. And we Europeans, we are in our mindset, we are doing them a favor. We are sweating, we are making a great effort. We are uh, uh, fighting very hard to give these people the opportunity to pay for their sins. So it's not, I, I know that racism and, and, and um, whiteness and language and all that, these, these are important things because they are the result, because they are also the, the things that people feel. For example, Franz Fanon and, and other people. But in the mind of these people, of the Europeans, they're not saying, he, I am a racist person I am, and I am trying to say he's not human. In their mind, they're saving these people. And this is the point because if we don't understand what is going on inside the mind of the colonizer, we are not going to get rid of coloniality, of power, of philosophy, of metaphysics, of language, of anything. Why? Because these people, they were against anybody who was not Christian. So Christianity is a, a founding stone of colonial enterprise. Uh, just as much as economic, because we know Europeans were broke, they were poor, they were very, they had many sanitary problems, they had many uh, uh, crop problems, 
They were just coming out of the Black Plague. Uh, so they were on a very bad spot at that time. They said, we now have paid our sins. We now have suffered enough. And now we're going to teach the world. What were they going to teach the world? I have made a little, uh, some points that, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to have the time, but uh, what did they do? They created many theses that were thrust upon them by history and by their own choices. And then they try to organize it in a very different way. For example, uh, when the Renaissance begins in Italy and then spreads to, there was in Italy, but the, the Italic cities like Florence and whatever, uh, when that started, they, they inadvertently, they create a three period history. They say, we are here now, what, what we're gonna call this? I don't know, uh, time of the now. We have just come out of a terrible time, a black plague and inquisition and, and bizarre events and blah. We are gonna call this, I don't know yet, but this is what we have re recuperated. We have seen that the Greeks were amazing, the, the Romans were amazing. So what are we going to say? That that was a classic age, we are now trying to recuperate this classical age. And now we have a medieval time that is the, in the middle. What does that make us? It creates an idea of progress of history. It creates an idea that history unfolds itself, that the social is a thing, is a big whole that is evolving, that is doing what is, it is doing on its own. Uh, and they say, well, if we are here in the present and we are recuperating these values of the ancients, it means we are better. It means we are superior. It means we have gone through hell and we have survived. So what are we going to do? We are going to do the same thing with the rest of the world. People need to suffer. People need to, to feel uh, the necessity of the work in Christ and in history to save themselves. So as long as we keep saying that uh, modernity is only about economics, is only about uh, a race, we are going to be missing the point that what animated these people wasn't exactly if this person is this or that color, is that everybody's wrong. Everybody that didn't do what we did is wrong. It doesn't matter their color. It doesn't matter where they are from. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. So they created this idea of the big other, and this other doesn't matter. What matters is the modern, modern. So if we keep using modern categories, for example, progress of history, for example, a, a centralization of language as the house of being, uh, as the Nazi Heidegger said, or if we keep saying things like, um, uh, 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 History is uh, just an unfolding of events that is teleologically oriented. Uh, if we keep using these expressions, these concepts, we keep doing what these people did for five, six, seven hundred years to pagans in Europe, to Islam, people in, in, in Iberia, to the Jewish people, to the black people, to the African-American people, to the Amerindian people. It didn't matter to them. This is the point that I'm trying to say. It's not that uh, 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 the black people don't have the right to, to, to say and to posit, posit themselves. It's not that that I'm saying. I'm saying that in the mind of the European, they conceive of, a, of, a, of their standpoint as so universal that what is on the other side doesn't matter in their eyes. So uh, my contention is if we keep using uh, modern uh, ideologies and concepts and, uh, and the way of structuring our thought, we are not ever going to pay the price for the ouverture d'esprit, for the, for the openness of, of mind of trying to sit down in the lower Amazon basin and trying to understand what these people are saying. And they're not saying 
oh, there is the ideal human and everybody needs to be put inside this ideal human because they don't think like that. They think very different ways. And if we approach them with these conceptual instruments, uh, it's not going to go well. And we are going to be missing a very amazing opportunity to do a philosophy that doesn't need to rely on, on, on Marx and Hegel and, and Nietzsche and Freud. All these people are amazing, but perhaps we should discover new amazing people that aren't just saying the same old things all over again. Uh, thank you uh, for your time and for your patience. And that's it. Thank you, Otavio, for your, your presentation on complex realism and a gender theory of decoloniality. So now we will uh, open up the discussion for questions. Uh, we have one question on queue with Dr. Vallega. If you'd like to pose a question, you can mark an X in the chat. Si tienen una pregunta, pueden marcar una X en el chat. Y vamos a uh, empezar con Dr. Vallega. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me, right? Okay. So, uh, Gabriela, thank you. Uh, very interesting paper. Uh, and I, I was very excited about the paper because I heard you in some ways responding to the question that you asked us yesterday, which was, what, how do we move from aesthetics of liberation, decolonial aesthetics to community? And I think that uh, you began to answer in a beautiful way by saying, well, part of it is language, right? I mean, this is where it happens. So, and I agree completely with that. So my question is really about the way in which you're thinking about language and the operation of in language or through language, which might turn out to be something like a decolonial turn in language, right? So what I heard you, uh, the way I heard you was that uh, um, that language happens as a conversation, which is uh, what you said, an evoking of, soci of uh, uh, sociality. I think I I'm completely agree with that. I'm just wondering about this term. And what you made me think about was uh, about the term from uh, Paul Celan, uh, the, the, the title of his poems, uh, poems that, a series of poems that was written precisely after the war. He didn't write for years. And then the first thing he wrote was titled Atembende, which means breath turn. And I've always taken this term, breath turn, to have to do with the suspension of breathing that happens in breathing and the way in which that is part of language. So that language is not only about um, making a statements about the logic of language and about presence, but rather in that suspension, there is the possibility of engaging in a way that I would say is pre-reflexive uh, with silence, with absence, with loss, right? And I'm thinking that at that level, what I find is that in the breath turning, and I want to say turning because I think that there is something that you said, you, you just mentioned in passing that's very important, is that language is not a tool, but it's a process that is gerundive. So it's, it's a turning, it's a languaging, right, that is happening the way I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking that in that turning to that breath and that suspension of breath, in that fragility, there is a kind of suspension that unsettles the established present. And in that sense, it unsettles the whole epistemic, and if you will, to go back to the previous paper that just heard, the metaphysical structure of presencing and, and uh, the articulation of that presence in terms that are still uh, very much linked to the coloniality of power, in terms of articulation, measurement, explanation, and domination of existence, right? So I, I was wondering if you could say, uh, if you would have some thoughts about what I, what I, you made me think <laughs> mm -hmm. about. Thank you, uh, 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 Alejandro. I, I, I don't know porcelain, but definitely I will, I will check it out. What I was thinking when, when, when you were talking about this breath turn and this suspension was uh, uh, Ortega's understanding of silence, right? Like, because for him, for Ortega, and it's interesting because uh, uh, Maturana and Varela uh, look at Ortega a little bit, uh, is this idea that uh, 
silence is key to language, right? Like there, we cannot say uh, uh, everything, right? Like we need to silence some things in order to say others, right? And, and, and I look into what he meant by, by that. And I, 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 I wrote a little bit of it because for me, like he, he talks about this uh, language as a kind of common sense, right? Like uh, uh, the things uh, that we don't need to say. That the, that the other will understand, you know, like the, the presuppositions, because otherwise it will be specific, impossible to talk if we need to say everything, right? Like, so the sociality allowed us to mute certain things that the other just understands because they are in our same way of life. So I was looking at, at Maturana, so it, at, at Ortega, so it resonates a little bit what he was saying. And when I was looking at Ortega, I was trying to, to take that to the colonial situation, right? That is something that Ortega doesn't look at and to think, okay, then what is to silence somebody? So make silence a verb too, right? And, and, and what is to silence if we take this, 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 this uh, common sense that we can take for granted, if that is silence, what is to shut that up uh, 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 as an act of, of colonial power. So that's the first things I, I can build connections to, to what you were saying. And in this idea that I think that, that many of us are, are here uh, in best is that is dialogues. Uh, 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 of course, you know, like uh, uh, there are, there's not only Vivedos de Castro, right? Like there's a lot of people here that have invested their careers in seeing and listening the colonized, right? Uh, 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 so, uh, and Vivedos de Castro is definitely one of the authors that, that we go for. Uh, but uh, the, the type of dialogues that for me are interesting are dialogues between ourselves. Right, we are all very clear in how to contest oppression. Yes, we are all very clear in how to dialogue with the center, right? And that's something that Fanon also talked about. Like for him, the question of language was the question of the black man uh, and the French. Sorry, I don't want to take all the time for, uh, uh, uh. Let, me, let me finish there. It's just, uh, I think we are all invested in this question about how to listen to the colonized, how to listen to ourselves as colonized, uh, 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 and, and how we have been crossed by coloniality. I think that that's the type of, of, of thing that I am I'm point out with this monolanguaging. It's something that transverses all of us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Alejandro. Next, we have a question from Manuel Vargas. Hi, I just uh, want to thank all the presenters for their, their efforts and, and for the talks. Um, this is a question for Otavio. So, um, Otavio, I, so one of the things I, I think was interesting about your talk was the way in which it was inviting us to think carefully about how the particular details of um, religious convictions and religious motivations uh, will have shaped the, the, the practices that, that people pursued and, and are explanatory with respect to why it was that the conquest unfolds the way it, uh, it did. Um, so, uh, but I guess I'm curious and I want to hear more about the, uh, the complaint at the end of the talk about the do we need to go back to Marx? Do we need to go back to Nietzsche? Do we need to go back to Foucault? Um, and partly in, in, in relationship to this claim about the centrality of the particulars of, of, of theological doctrine. So, so here's one way of, of putting the question. Uh, I guess I wouldn't have, uh, I guess it would be surprising to me if, if, if the folks who are saying we need to understand economic analyses or power analyses or any of these sorts of things, um, it, uh, would be inclined to deny that uh, that many of the people involved in the conquest of the Americas were and the subsequent colonization of the Americas were religious. I think they're prepared to concede all of that. The, the question or the issue I would have thought is whether or not the particulars of theological commitments are more explanatory than economic pressures or than power pressures or then and then insert you know all the particular details of your standard Marxian or Foucaulting or uh, Foucault or Quijano or you know pick whatever theoretical framework you like 
And, and, and I take it that the thought of the, 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 kind, the kind of views that I take it that you're presenting your position as in opposition to is, is not a denial of the, the particulars of theological belief, but it's a, it's a claim or it's a presumption anyway about um, what's more explanatorily useful. So in some sense, this is an invitation about, you know, can you say a little bit more about what, um, I guess, why it is that you think that the theological particulars of, um, of, of the Iberian Peninsula is more explanatory than, than economic or social or any of these other kinds of explanations that arise in, uh, in the theoretical frameworks common to decoloniality. Hey, thank you for your question. Uh, as I said, I was starting to write this paper and it was very big, so I couldn't include everything. And one of the things that I was going to include is that the, the, the Christian theology, they present a challenge for everybody when they impose a dualism in the world. We have the creator, we have creation. This dualism says there is an unbridgeable abyss between these two things that can only be bridged by faith. And that when we are here on the side of creation, why do we, we descendants of Adam and Eve and those people whose names I don't remember, why do we, why can we do what we do? Because God said so. We can't, what, what is nature? Nature exists to serve us. Adam said, this is a bird, this is a dog, this is a cat. When Adam names things, it becomes his domain. So when we, we have this framework working inside our mind, we need to remind that there aren't many religions in the world that do this claim other than the Abrahamic traditions. Not. I, I, I actually don't think from the religions that I have studied, none of them do this, that say that nature is a property, it's a domain, that whatever is must be used. It needs to have a function that we, descendants of Adam, did. So when we say this world is what I want it to be, it's because I have a peace of the, the logos. The logos, well, as we remember from the, uh, the Gospel of John, God is a logos. He is a fiat. He is, he is, he just is. And this is, is this giant logos. And he donates a piece of his logos to each human that is Christian, of course, uh, or Abrahamic. Uh, and uh, and we, therefore, are legitimized. We have legitimacy to do whatever we want to do. So if there is economic pressure, it's because we feel that we can do it. It's not a problem for the Abrahamic faith, especially the Christian faith, to do whatever they want to do. If it is mercantilism, if it is liberalism, if it is neoliberalism, if it is blah, blah, blahism, it doesn't matter. It matters is I have absolute freedom and legitimacy from God to do whatever the hell I want to do. So this idea of freedom, of domain, of I have to fear God. Under God, I can do whatever I want, as long as it doesn't contradict with the religion and all that. But I, I believe that we, in a Max Weber kind of way, we kind of lose sight, kind of lose a very golden opportunity to see the religious phenomenon as guiding things. And these other things, they come up as uh, uh, the fallout, as what happened when these people that thought they could do whatever they wanted in order to spread the, the good word of the Lord, uh, what the results are, racism and capitalism and all that. But these things, they are born into fruit uh, through a religious conviction that says you can do whatever you want. You can enslave, you can uh, rape, you can do whatever because it doesn't matter. They, are, uh, they need to suffer as you did. They need to pay for their sin, for their Satanism, 
for their blah, blah, blah. So uh, these people need to be converted uh, and the path to conversion, to conversion is paved in suffering. That is the basic uh, Catholic worldview. And the Protestant view is you need to suffer through work. It's not suffer in general. You need to suffer through work. You need to work to your bones and you need to, to do whatever uh, uh, is necessary to, 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 to attain your salvation. And it doesn't matter if you explore other people. It doesn't matter if you enslave other people. It, doesn't, it, does, it just doesn't matter inside their heads. So that's the point. The, these other things, they are results. They are fallouts. They are the aftermath of these uh, self-imposed absolute freedom uh, that Hegel always is talking about. The absolute freedom, the absolute spirit, the absolute action, the absolute reason. So this is, this has uh, an undeniable religious origin that uh, a secular scholars such as myself, and I, I think many of, of you, uh, we, we tend to ignore because we say, no, religion is, it just isn't as important as it was. It's not the same. It's not the case. We see evangelical people and religious fanaticism today much more than 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. So I think that we need to take these things into consideration uh, because I believe they do have a very uh, important explanatory power. Thank you. Uh, we have several questions <laughs> on queue. So um, running low on time, I'm just going to at this point ask um, the first three, uh, Don Deere, Grant, and Rafaela, to ask their questions. Okay, I, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, I have a question for uh, Rosa and Gabriela. I mean, thank you first for a really amazing panel. Um, I guess starting with a kind of a question about race and Quijano, which maybe kind of goes to both of you. Um, maybe starting with Rosa's paper, I was curious about how you see um, the concept of whiteness shifting from, let's say, Quijano to Fanon. Um, I, I took it as part of your paper as a kind of a critique of Quijano for not offering a sufficient account of whiteness. Um, but I'm wondering um, about that historical shift from the 16th century to um, when Fanon is writing in, in Martinique. And um, does, is Quijano able to offer a concept of whiteness. I mean, there's surely something linked to the concept of labor and, and um, uh, wage labor and, and all that. I was just curious if you could say a little more about that. Okay, I promise to be brief. So um, just briefly, Gabriela, I mean, a related point, there's, there's a kind of critique of Quijano in terms of is this concept of race too totalizing already in the 16th century that um, we could divide between uh, three or four different kinds of labor and that's it. Um, isn't the, the operation of race in the colonial world actually quite more complex than that? Like thinking about the role of mestizos, for example, where do they fit on that racial hierarchy that Quijano is developing? I'm just curious um, how that might relate to your own conception of the coloniality of language and how it links to race. Are there other forms of linguistic racialization other than silencing? Or are there various different kind of hierarchies and thinking about the role that language and writing, the, that, that critique plays um, in the perspective of the colonized, um, maybe the relationship between writing and speech, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. And Grant, if you'd like to ask your question. Yeah, mine is very quick for Gabriela. Um, you, you said briefly that the colonized cannot uh, inhabit a, a normative position, um, that inhabiting a position of normativity is, is a problem for the colonized. But I, I'd like to push you on this a little bit in the sense that I think the colonized can inhabit a position of normativity, but only as an object. We can't control the normativity. We, we can't dictate what will become the norm but we can only inhabit it in this passive manner, right? Where uh, I'm thinking of linguistic assimilation, 
right? Um, so I could, I could speak English, uh, but strictly in quotations, like Joe Stromer from The Clash said, right? Um, so I just want to push you on that point to make that, uh, if you could just clarify that. Just a brief question. Who said that, Grant? Uh, the philosopher Joe Strummer from The Clash, <laughs> from the band The Clash. It's, he's got this line, speaking English in quotations, right? Um, so I could speak English, but only in this, only in this way. I can't control what will become English, right? Um, so I just want to push you on the point that the colonized can't inhabit the norm. I think we can, but only passive in this passive way. And then it will take Rafaela's questions. Um, from Do everyone hear me? Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry I came late to this meeting, but I would like to ask a question to Octavio. Uh, it's very usual in modern uh, thought, uh, a way of thinking that privileges some uh, category of the world, so I will uh, give some examples, uh, gender or race or language or power or economics. It's very common uh, in modernity to take one or a few of these categories of the world and make them a rock basis to explain everything as, uh, as a absolute of Hegel. For example, and I would like to ask you if how the this modern idea uh, is is still um, present in the colonial thought, and if it's possible to think to truly think the coloniality uh, thought if we use these categories, because for example, one of uh, one of the modern ideas really present is the bifurcation between nature and culture. So the people who were um, next to culture, such as European people, they would be more, they would be better, they will, would have a privileged view upon the world. So they would need to take this cultural people such as black people, such as Af African American in general, Asian people, uh, indigenous people, they would need to take this culture, they, this culture side of, of uh, humanity, they would need to colonize, to, to put the spirit, to put the, the culture. So how is it possible if we keep the same category of and the bifurcation, nature, culture, and other categories, such as power, gender, race, I, I will not deny that these categories are important, but I am trying to say that they cannot be the rock solid basic of ex explanation to everything, because this is what moderns do. They take one thing, such as God, for example, and God explains everything. There's nothing beyond God. If we take one okay, category, such if, as if I may, if, if I may urge, um, can you point your question uh, out just so that we can also have time? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Denise. So this is the the question: Can we do the colonial uh, the colonial thought if we do this kind of thinking? If we privilege a category, that's it. Gabriela, are you speaking? If so, yeah, you're I, I, I will just ask, uh, because there's a lot of questions, and I think the most important thing when one comes to a conference is hear what people think and get the feedback. So I, I, I don't care much for answering. I can, you know, we can stay later. But if, if all the people that have questions can, can ask them or type them, so we can take them for that with us, that, that would be lovely. Uh, uh, so what, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, and also, of course, we can continue conversations on the side where we can contact each other because the conference will allow. Yeah, I mean, we can stay in the room for like a little bit more, but the, the, the people, the technical people will need to leave. So I, I'm just pointed to that. Uh, that's why time is pressing, not that we are shutting, you know. Right. Uh, 
we do have a few questions in the chat that the readers can read as well. Um, but since there are a couple of questions that aren't listed, so Rosa Maria, you also have the floor um, to, to point anything out. Yeah, I just briefly would like to say that my presentation was not much a critique to Quijano, but was more like expanding on Quijano's framework in the centrality of race. Um, because of course, like the concept of whiteness is not a monolithic concept. Um, it's a concept that developed, you know, through modernity, especially in the 18th century with race science. And what I wanted to do is expand on Quijano's observation that the creation of America and the creation of the racialized population was in some sense what like produced the creation of Europe, produced the creation of the geocultural identity of Europe when the creation of modernity. So in the same way, I was one was asking or thinking, you know, how the creation of this racialized population through history resulted in creating, you know, this other non-colonized, non-racialized identity that is whiteness. As you know, I was trying to point at that co-constitution that you have with the process of racialization and the process of the consolidation of whiteness. Um, but as um, Octavio also pointed, like this is not to say that there was an intentionality in the mindset of the colonizer that I am as a white person going to like impose this negation of being, but this was a process that resulted from different like conceptualization of the other that you know had previously you know christian and religious like ways of of making that differentiation but i think what winter is pointing is that we see a shift even in 16th century colonization with the spanish crown when they were trying to move away from that process the way of making human differentiation based on the distinction of christians and infidel to a process of differentiation that is like a human nature differentiation. You know, the, the, and they, um, many like scholars see these um, descriptions of how indigenous people were described as non-civilized, as savages, as non-fully human. So a lot of these like um, critiques that we're doing come precisely from those descriptions that came from the eye of the colonizer, the description that deny culture to the colonized people, the description that deny the humanity of black people because it's the, the, the negation of humanity what allows you know, a group of human beings to, to cosify, to make other human beings as objects. So we cannot understand slavery if we not understand that there is a way of looking at the other that is already neg negating that humanity. So these analyses are a little bit complex and I rely a little bit on Sylvia Winter because she is trying to look those historical process of transformation and she's not asking much for the intentionality of the colonizing, but how the colonized use these courses that come from Christianity, use these courses that come from modernity to make, to, to you know, continue this project that was very lucrative for Europe and that we cannot like understand how Europe, um, you know, you know, develop itself materially without the extraction of resources from um, Latin America. Um, and one last thing that I, I would like to um, invite people to think is that I recently discovered the work of um, Cedric Robinson and he is like bringing a very complex analysis in this complex intertwining between process of racialization, um, religious belief and economic process that were antecedent and that became the condition of possibility for colonization. Thank you. We have uh, one more question, Pedro Guzman, uh, and then others listed in the chat so that the, um, the speakers can start thinking about their responses to any of the questions posed. Pedro Guzman? Yes, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to thank the presenters for, um, for the presentation that they have, they have um, given me. It's very, very interesting and very, very um, um, informative. And the question I wanted to give was uh, specifically for, um, so sorry, let me get the name again, um, for Mr. Octavio Maciel. And the question I wanted to make was, um, wouldn't a more accurate description to the uh, colonization of the Americas uh, be the faulty interpretation of the religious teachings and traditions of Christianity? Because you did mention that it was because of Christianity, you know, spreading the uh, the word of God and and and, um, and civilizing the savages, as as they put it, as Christopher Columbus Columbus put it in his uh, letters to uh, Spain. Um, wouldn't a, wouldn't a more accurate statement be 
a faulty interpretation rather than a taking the teachings and and uh, and and taking them and uh, spreading them to the to, to the Americas because there was one part where you you stated that a suffering was part of the process towards reaching eternal life or, reach, or reaching heaven and you know for instance uh, Jesus Christ within the teachings of Christianity uh, never stated that suffering was a part it, he stated that suffering was a part of practicing christian uh christian ideology and christian religion not that suffering was part of reaching heaven um and so basically my question would be would you agree that it it would be a bit more accurate to say that it would be a faulty interpretation of religious teachings rather than taking the teachings and spreading them towards the americas thank you so much so Maybe I can take a few minutes to answer uh, a cup, uh, you know, the, um, some of the questions. I can just pack them together, uh, uh, particularly Don and Grant, and, and there's a question also on the chat. Uh, I'm, I'm, we are the criticism to Quijano. It's it's uh, it's fair to certain extents, you know, the, the simplification. What I like, what is useful for me philosophically useful is uh, uh, how his idea of race that is different from Omi and Winant, yes, uh, gives us an understanding of not whiteness, you know, like I, 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 but of dehumanization, yes, as a process, not just as a process that happened at the encounter, but a process that will start and continue to happen. So that idea of race, yes, uh, uh, I think that when we look at it philosophically, to me, it's very useful. Historically, there's a lot of problems with, with, with Quijano's appreciation of how colonization happened. But as you know, he was my, my maestro, right? I study with him. And he will always say, Mijita, that's your work to do, you know, like, uh, uh, so that's that, that. So, and I appreciate that, you know, I think our maestros, eh, Enrique, eh, Maria Lugones, you know, they, they did that for us, you know, they, they, they give us tools to name things that didn't have name before. And they give us to us people that are on the colonized side of things. So uh, uh, there's a question. Uh, that's the type of dialogues that I'm interested, right? Like I don't think, and, and that is something I learned with Lugones, to believe that because we are all on the colonized side of power, we are gonna understand each other is a mistake. And that's not to see the power of coloniality, right? So that the kind of dialogues I'm interested in are dialogues among colonized. Yes, among people that are in different places of coloniality. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, to re, you know, uh, understanding that, you know, as Grant said, you know, the coloniality of language, the coloniality of knowledge has transformed in just objects or parrots, right? Like that can just speak English in quotations. Uh, 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 so, uh, what, what I'm saying, Grant, is that it's not that we cannot occupy the normative, we are not the normative speaker, right? We are not the, the rational. Yes, of course, we are the object. Uh, uh, but in your point about assimilation, and you know, uh, uh, I think that from we understand this, the options, the decolonial options uh, regarding language are necessary many, right? Because we are in different locations of coloniality. So for Fanon, it was liberatory that the colonized speak better French than the French, right? Like with Césaire, like we need to speak better French than the French. And that was his linguistic strategy. And Gigu was, you know, like, fuck English, let's give up the colonial language because it's so tied to colonial alienation that we need to, to break what he called this fatalistic logic of the unassailable position of English. Right, but then you have indigeneity, right? I, and and Liam Simpson. This was the paper I was going to read, right? Liam Simpson saying like, let's revitalize uh, indigenous language. What happened with us? I don't have an indigenous language, right? So for me, 
Spanish? Am I doomed to speak Spanish? So that kind of questions, I think, uh, uh, involve different uh, philosophical exercise, different political actions. But then to put all that alternatives in conversation, I think it's, it's, it's interesting and that's where, where politics uh, uh, should, should go, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I know there, I, I, I copy paste the, the questions that are in the chat. I'm taking it uh, with me. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, uh, Vishnu, for your questions. All right, speakers, we have about um, a little less than five minutes. Any of the other questions that you want to address um, that are in the chat? Leave well? our emails or any contact information so we could keep. You uh, can definitely talking. type that in the chat if that's easier for you. Um, it may make it easier for you to com maintain communication if they see the email address in the chat or one of you will. Yeah, I'll leave my email on, on the chat uh, because th there isn't enough time, but. Uh, the I, I will sum up the questions and there were many things like uh do we need to go back to 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 marx or freud or kant or hegel uh do we need to to go back to christianity or, or that or that the what i'd like to say is perhaps it's not a a point of reinterpreting marx or or, or kant yet again but perhaps reinterpretation of what liberation is. Perhaps philosophy of liberation could be uh, revamped through new ideas of liberty, of freedom, of whatever. And I would like just to point out one thing, if we don't have time, uh, the idea of moksha in Jainism, which is a, a religion in India. They considered God not to be the ultimate reality, the gods in their case. Uh, for their idea of gods is you need to work. You need to answer people's prayers. You need to keep listening and, and, and checking on people. You need to make rain. You need to make the crops grow. So you have a job if you are a god. Their idea of moksha was to transcend God they present themselves as transtheistic. So the, the, the state of illumination of the end uh, of everything is to be so free. You don't even need to make the crops grow. You don't even need to make it rain. You are just absolutely free to, to be, just to be. So perhaps the idea of liberation is what we should be talking about, reinterpreting through uh, different lenses, through different eyes, through different ideas of, of liberty. And not just say, okay, I found out a new way of read Marx. I found a new way to read Kant. Okay, congratulations, but please, that's not what actually I'm interested about. And uh, to Pedro, uh, I, I believe that we can all keep saying about its faulty interpretation. That can be said about anything. Okay, Christian, Christianity and communism and liberalism and capitalism and modernity, they were misinterpreted. Well, we can say that about anything. But the, the fact remains that it was a social fact that that version of Christianity is what was imposed on Americas. It wasn't imposed the idea that Christ says, love thy neighbor. That wasn't the, the parlance. And even if it was the parlance, it wasn't the practice. So the practice was kill people, enslave people, and say, if you do not accept God, you are a pagan, you are a Satanist, and you need to be killed. So if Christianity was misinterpreted, if Marxism was misinterpreted, that doesn't concern me particularly. It concerns me what happened as a social fact. So as a social fact, unfortunately, uh, these ideologies that are very beautiful, they're very, they have uh, uh, legions of followers, but uh, uh, we need to pay attention to what happened, really, not just about interpretation. So this is my anti-Nietzsche speech. So it's, uh, for me, it's about facts, not just interpretations, okay? I'll put my, my email here if people want to. Yes, I want to uh, 
encourage, I think um, maybe Rosa Maria, if you want to um, put that in there, people can contact you and likewise, uh, you all can look at the questions, especially those typed. Um, thank you all for a great session. Thank you all the attended, especially our speakers. Thank you, Denise, for moderating. I hope you all enjoy the conference. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Thanks for the questions. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Vishnu, if you are still there, please write out your email here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, once again, it would be wonderful if the organizers... I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, at least, you know, I mean, it's, it's as, a, as, a, as, a, as an organizer, it's a little difficult because you have to ask permission to distribute everybody's emails. Right. So uh, uh, I always, I, I've been in conference that they put everybody's email in the program. And I suggest that for this one, but uh, uh, it, it, people didn't think it was that a good idea. So, uh, but, you know... Uh, uh, we have Rosa's email, you have mine, you have uh, Otavio's. So, and, and we'll see you in the rest of the... All right, I hope that everyone's had uh, time to copy and paste the emails. I'm gonna have to close the... the yes, yes, so give me a second, uh, Preston. I, okay, yeah, you can my, click, my computer is funny. You can save the chat by clicking the ellipsis ah. in the chat. I'll just, I'll save it can myself. You, okay, yes, please. If anyone ah, I see I see the ellipses. Can... Wait, wait. Yeah, I'm gonna okay. if anyone wants the <laughs> so chat, uh, you can go ahead and email the email that I've just put in. And where does it save it? You know? Uh, I mean that's part of the tricky part. I think it's a folder somewhere in your Zoom program files. So Oh awesome. Okay, okay. If Good. you don't yeah, if you if you're in the audience and you hadn't been able to save it, you can just email me and I'll just forward it to you. Thanks so much, Preston. Great work. Right. See you in the next. Thank session. you, Olive. Thank you, Denise and Gabriela.